Aloha. Aloha. <laughs> there we go. Congratulations on your graduation day and mine as well. <laughs> and I'm really happy that most of you will graduate. Just kidding, just kidding. <laughs> Um, now, this is the first time that Rosita's been in town to graduate, so first graduation for her. <laughs> now, Virginia Wyman, she's a pro. Cause, you know, she, uh, she came dressed last year. <laughs> Today we celebrate together with music and lunch, so all are welcome. Our goal for the Mini Med School is to provide meaningful information on healthy aging, so I hope you acquired just such information and had fun too. Now update on this COVID-19, it's here, <laughs> which we always thought it would be. Over 100,000 cases, but 3,462 deaths. It will keep on going. Primary deaths are in older people. Um, so the biggest impact right now, other than certainly the deaths, which are always dismaying, is that the economic loss. And it is real because it's not the fear of the virus, it's the fear of quarantine. Most people are okay, They're, they have good sense and common sense about the virus. Wash your hands, don't touch your nose or face, you know, things like that. But it's the quarantine that's really bothering most people. And so far in the US we have 267 cases with 14 deaths. It is not considered a pandemic yet, because still the majority of cases have been in one country. So that's, that's the update. Now I want to say mahalo nui loa to you students, our speakers, folks from the UH Cancer Center, JABSOM, and the UH Foundation, and all of the donors who make it possible for us to continue offering this course and not have to charge. Now I really enjoyed seeing so many mini med school students at the Dean's Circle the other night. That was just great. Helen Keller said, Alone we can do so little, to get together we can do so much. And that is really true. Now keep an eye out for emails from me regarding additional learning opportunities and many med school invitations. On your seat again is the course evaluation. If you've already filled one out, just leave it in the boxes back there. We recycle, we can reuse. Now our first speaker for today is Dr. Catherine Kurosu. And I learned about her from a mini med school student. She has certainly had an interesting career in OBGYN, but has expanded her expertise to include both Eastern and Western medicine. I really liked her statement that she learned there are many ways to approach a problem and the patient usually understands their illness best. Please welcome Catherine. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hinshaw, and Dr. Leung, and Ms. Dr. Weinman, or Ms. Weinman? Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> well, after your graduation, then we can call you Dr. Weinman. Um, uh, this is a fabulous program, and uh, I'm uh, really delighted to have been asked to speak today. Um, we don't have benefit of a pointer, uh, so I will uh, be using the mouse here. And we'll have uh, ample time for questions, I hope, at the end. First, uh, I'd like to tell you a little bit about myself and my journey to uh, combining Eastern and Western medicine. One of the uh, first questions people ask me when they come uh, for their appointments is, how did I switch from what they would consider to be medicine to uh, acupuncture and Eastern medicine? My answer to them is that uh, I feel that I am practicing medicine. I am on a continuum, there's a spectrum, there are many ways to approach a problem as uh, uh, a lot of people agree. Um, but I began my journey in Toronto. So for those of you who have not been in Toronto, um, there's the CN Tower. My medical school is right here. Um, and my first encounter with acupuncture was at the University uh, of Toronto in uh, 1988, so more than 30 years ago. Uh, there was an optional lecture by a general surgeon about acupuncture, and I went to that. And he um, was explaining a bit about how acupuncture worked, but at the time, not a lot was known in a Western sense. 
Um, and he asked if anybody in the audience had a headache, and I happened to have a headache at the time. I put my hand up, and he said, come on down. And so I received my very first acupuncture treatment in 1988, um, and he put uh, one needle in, in my hand here, and my headache lifted, and I was really impressed by that, but I didn't do anything about that uh, for a couple of decades later. And so I ended up um, uh, moving to San Diego with my military helicopter uh, pilot husband, and it was in San Diego that I really started to get involved with acupuncture. Um, at the time, I was uh, practicing obstetrics and gynecology, and uh, one of the um, duties of an obstetrician was turning breech babies. So um, I'm sure you were all very confused about the uh, photographs and your slides, going, how does this all relate? And so this is, this is how it relates. This is uh, what's called a frank breech with the baby with the, the legs uh, both up and the bottom down, and it's uh, not ideal to deliver a baby in this position, although it is certainly possible. Um, so an obstetrician will uh, at times actually physically get the baby to do either a frontward or a backward somersault uh, to get into the correct position to then go into labor normally. Um, and that procedure is uh, very uncomfortable and it can cause fetal distress. Uh, it could damage the placenta and it was definitely not my favorite thing to do. And I happened to come across a uh, randomized control trial that was very well designed um, that used um, uh, an herb that they burned over a particular acupuncture point um, that is known to turn breech babies. Um, just, you don't even touch the patient. Uh, there's something about the herb, the heating of the point, and probably some aromatherapy aspect to that particular herb that causes the babies to move. And when the baby moves sufficiently, if it's able to, uh, it will turn about 60% of the time. So serendipitously, I, I did find an acupuncturist in my area who was willing to take my patients. And uh, her success rate was about two out of three. And so, that, okay, this is really cool. And I started to send her other sorts of patients, like gynecology patients, people that um, I'd sort of come to the end of what I could do with them from a Western sense. I even remember one particular patient who was suffering from chronic pelvic pain, and she, um, uh, I'd taken her to the operating room, I'd done a diagnostic laparoscopy, and I couldn't find anything that I could really explain why she was having uh, so much trouble. And after seeing this acupuncturist, who had now become my friend, um, uh, she was 80% better after uh, four treatments, and you know, I couldn't match that. And I thought, okay, uh, how can I learn how to do this. So my friend, the acupuncturist, supervised me doing a treatment on her. And at first I thought, well, I can't possibly put needles into people. And she, and she said, well, like, come on, you're a surgeon, right? So <laughs> I, said, I said, yeah, but they're always asleep or they have an epidural. And she said, it's easy, really. So she showed me where some points were. And you can feel these points. Um, and uh, um, I did a small treatment on her and she felt that I had a nice touch and encouraged me to continue. So uh, I did become um, a medical, oh, there's the moxa for those of you who are, it's called moxa bustion. Um, and um, so uh, this, this, this is me doing acupuncture. Um, so I did continue and I became a medical acupuncturist, which is a, a program for medical doctors to uh, spend about 300 hours uh, learning uh, about acupuncture, because we already know how to do a history and a physical and, and all of these things. And in every state but Hawaii, that is sufficient for a medical doctor to practice acupuncture. So when uh, we came here, I enrolled in the um, school in Chinatown, the Institute of Acupuncture and Oriental Medicine, and did the 3,000 hour course um, to become a licensed acupuncturist in Hawaii, because I knew uh, I wanted to stay in Hawaii, um, and I knew that I wanted to continue uh, in acupuncture. And uh, that's where I met uh, your colleague, Debbie Harai, who was, uh, was a great student to work with. So, as I was saying, I feel that uh, Eastern, practicing Eastern medicine is still practicing medicine. Everything is, 
a continuum, and it's fascinating the way Western and Eastern medicine dovetail so very nicely. Um, uh, acupuncture is only a component of uh, Eastern medicine. Uh, there is really so much more uh, to it than just you know, sticking needles into people in inappropriate places. So if you imagine um, uh, Western um, medicine being the yellow circle and <clears throat> Eastern medicine being the blue circle, um, where they overlap is where uh, so much of uh, uh, all medical traditions uh, overlap in terms of the encouragement of uh, uh, appropriate lifestyle choices. So more and more uh, sleep is, is becoming very, very, I mean, it's always been important, but the, it seems that we need to know exactly why scientifically it's important. And over the last um, decade or so, there's more uh, sleep studies and functional MRIs coming out and biochemical testing to uh, explain to people why sleep is so important and what happens when you don't get enough sleep. In uh, Chinese medicine, Eastern medicine, uh, sleep is, is very important. It's one of the, the things that you always ask a patient about when they come in, even if they're coming in for neck pain or the, uh, an ankle sprain, you always ask them, how's your sleep? You know, do you have trouble falling asleep, staying asleep, combination of both? Do you have frequent disturbing dreams, and there's stuff that you can do for that. And uh, helping somebody to sleep is uh, one, one of the, the primary uh, ways that you can help make that, turn the corner in terms of uh, their health struggles. Um, uh, Eastern medicine also talks about uh, nutrition, as does Western medicine, um, in slightly different ways, but still what you eat is important. Whole foods, mostly plants, not too much, just as Michael Pollan says, who's written uh, some excellent books about um, how we should eat and where we should get our food from. Um, Eastern medicine and now Western medicine as well both uh, encourage restorative practices. And these would include meditation, tai chi, qi gong, um, and uh, yoga. You know, so uh, all all of these things allow your brain to rest, your central nervous system uh, to rest, and to balance the fight and flight part of your central nervous system with the rest and digest part, and so that you become uh, a calmer person, and it allows your body to function better. Um, uh, Eastern and Western medicine also encourage more uh, active forms of exercise, the cardiovascular exercise, uh, to your level of ability. So the way they, uh, some would say that they differ, but I contend that they don't really differ that much. If you look um, from the Western point of view at drugs and pharmaceuticals, well, what are herbs except drugs and pharmaceuticals? You know, so, uh, so many, uh, of the majority of our Western drugs derive from plants, and people tend to forget that. Aspirin was from willow bark. Many cancer therapies are from um, all sorts of uh, Pacific, yew, Pacific yew tree or periwinkle and all kinds of plants. Um, so the, they are, they, uh, there's a direct comparison there. Uh, this is a physical therapy and massage therapy. Uh, in Chinese medicine and Eastern medicine, there are forms of uh, massage in, in Chinese medicine, it's called Tui Na, and it takes advantage of the, um, the structure of uh, the channels, which we'll talk about uh, in Eastern medicine, um, to uh, get, basically get the circulation going, whether you want to call it just the blood or the qi or the combination of both. And so massage and physical therapy, they, they also do the same thing. Now. Um, surgery uh, and acupuncture, um, they do share a lot in common, although having done both surgery and acupuncture, I can tell you that surgery is a little more involved. But um, the idea is that you are making a physical change in the body, and then the, the body will then direct its attention to the area uh, that you have uh, highlighted. and help the body to heal. 
and, the, and we'll talk a little more, I hope, I hope you all did your homework about reading about the placebo response, yes. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about acupuncture, sham acupuncture and placebo, but at this point I'd like to mention that um, there, are, there have been um, studies where they've done actually placebo surgeries. Uh, they've done uh, knee surgeries on people where a certain arm got the actual surgery and the placebo arm got the anesthesia, they got all the attention, and they got an incision. As far as they knew, they had surgery because they can't tell what went on the inside. Um, and a large number of the people who got the, the fake knee surgery improved. And, and so um, we'll we can talk a little bit later about what happens in that sort of healing response, but it, it demonstrates that um, the body can heal. Sometimes it just needs a nudge in the right direction. And when I'm doing acupuncture, uh, I look at it as this is, a, it's, it's very sort of surgical in a way. There's the preparation and there's the, uh, the actual procedure and it's very tactile and uh, while you're doing it kind of nothing else matters like the same way when you're doing surgery nothing else matters so um, so there is a, a huge overlap um, I believe in uh, Eastern and Western medicine and it really is uh, you know in some ways one and the same so so um, I guess because uh, uh, I'm probably a surgeon at heart. Uh, what draws me most to Eastern medicine really is the acupuncture, so we'll talk quite a bit about that. Um, uh, the word acupuncture comes from uh, uh, acus, needle in Latin, and puncture in English, obvious. Um, and so how many people have actually had acupuncture here? Show of hands. Excellent, okay. Um, and so uh, you, you do insert a needle through the skin. You need to have some sensation to activate the healing process, but the degree of sensation doesn't have to be outrageous. Um, the styles of acupuncture vary wi widely fr uh, from a very delicate Japanese style to more um, uh, assertive Korean style and Chinese is sort of somewhere in between. You can even um, do uh, laser acupuncture by um, uh, you, uh, putting a light source on the points, and that, that, does, that can be enough, especially in children, to activate a healing process. Um, although some people have said that acupuncture has been in existence for 5,000 years, there's, there isn't actually the documentation to back that up, but there is definitely known uh, texts that demonstrate that acupuncture has been in use for over 2,000 years, which you know, has a, that's a pretty good track record. Um, and uh, it's been increasingly incorporated into allopathic or Western conventional care. So um, even uh, veteran, veterinarians uh, do acupuncture. I've had several patients ask me if, I, if they could bring in their dogs. <laughs> and, um, but, uh, but to do veterinary uh, acupuncture, you really have to be a veterinarian. So I refer them to the, to the person across the street from my office in Kailua. So, 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 but the point being is that uh, the dog or the horse or the cat, they, they don't particularly have an emotional attachment to what's going on or, or uh, overlay. So, so I think the fact that acupuncture is useful in animals also demonstrates that there really is something happening and we know more and more about what that thing really is uh, now uh, in Western medicine, which we'll come to momentarily. Um, so for those of you who have not had acupuncture and are nervous about the needles, this is uh, just a dem to demonstrate how teeny tiny these needles actually are. Um, so if you're a regular matchstick at 42 millimeters, a medical syringe, uh, a sewing needle, and then this is a 0.25 millimeter acupuncture needle. And this is the thicker ones. Uh, the ones that I use in my practice are usually 0.16, sometimes 0.12, so about half that size. And um, uh, 0.12 millimeters is just a tiny bit thicker than a human hair. So um, it, it, they're very, very small, but, but they're very effective. So acupuncture does uh, a whole lot of different things at once. Um, and it, 
primarily, um, <clears throat> its use is for decreasing pain. And um, it also modulates how your brain perceives the pain. And there's a lot of Western research involved in um, the change in people's brains when they suffer from chronic pain and how the connections within your brain are strengthened to basically sensitize your brain to, to pain. So you become even uh, more um, uncomfortable even with a small amount of pain. So acupuncture serves to reverse that process. Um, it does increase um, blood flow at the needle insertion point. Um, but you can also, uh, uh, it sends mess, it's, I'll explain how it sends messages to, to the nerves, um, but it can increase your, actually your cardiac contractility and, and decrease the ri uh, rate of cardiac arrhythmias. Um, it, in, it changes basically how your brain uh, is wired. And um, we talked a little bit about um, the uh, central nervous system. It also releases endorphins and balances serotonin, uh, other neurotransmitters, and um, uh, it improves the function of your organs. It can make your uh, bowels work better and your, um, the, the, the wave that goes through your intestines increases in uh, frequency when you needle a certain acupuncture point. Um, and um, it can also be very helpful in um, uh, reproductive processes like getting women's uh, menstrual cycles to regulate, uh, to ovulate more regularly, and uh, for the lining of the uterus to, to be uh, more optimal for implantation of an embryo. Almost everybody uh, who comes to my office says, okay, how does this really work? Some people don't care. They just, they just say, it works, I don't care. But, but a lot of people are really interested in, in the process. And um, there are uh, a variety of ways of looking at it. Um, from um, an ancient point of view, uh, the way acupuncture, they think, was um, uh, c came across was there was a, someone was injured with an arrow, and then they survived that injury, and then another comorbidity or like back pain or something else went away. So uh, it is the potentially old wives' tale about how it started. And then just the Chinese being very um, uh, good at observation, you know, started to say, well, what happens if we do this? What happens if we do that? And then connecting <clears throat> what they did to what occurred and creating a theory around that. But within that and within every other uh, healing system, there is the concept that there is healing, your body heals. There's a healer within or a vital force. Um, the Chinese call it the web that has no weaver. Like there is some innate intelligent force within nature that strives to heal or, and live. <clears throat> so acupuncture does um, bring, bring that forth. Um, you've heard of uh, the concept of qi, that, that vital force or energy. Um, and uh, this is like the process of like the cooking of the rice and the rising of the steam um, that nourishes us. So the chi is nourishing. This is a very complex slide and I'm not gonna go over all of these, but um, this uh, highlights that there are channels within the body that you can't actually physically see um, that are, um, convey this chi through your body. They're not blood vessels, they're not lymphatics, they're not actually nerves, even though uh, if you know any anatomy, the, um, the arms the, the look very much like they go along the path of the three major nerves of the upper extremity. Um, but if you dissected an acupuncture point, what you would find there is an increased concentration of blood vessels, uh, lymphatics, and nerves, but no actual other thing. And uh, when you feel acupuncture points, they do feel a little different. They feel a little spongy, uh, a lot of them. Um, so uh, the way in which um, the theory was organized is that the um, the the vessels or the meridians or the channels 
uh, flow one into the other. Um, there are 12 principal meridians and they compose or uh, make up three great circuits. So, and this, um, the movement of the chi follows a 24 hour clock is what, what they say. Um, and so we start up here at the lung channel at about three o'clock in the morning and the chi is supposed to be within the organ associated with the channel for two hours and then shift to the next. So it goes um, to, from the lung channel to the large intestine and the stomach and then the spleen. So you wake up in the morning, you take your first breath. Um, uh, often people will evacuate their bowels and then they'll have something to eat and then they'll digest and then they'll get on with their day. And um, although, uh, although initially it sounded to me a little airy-fairy, I have to admit. Um, the more I've been researching into what they've discovered about Western circadian rhythms and peripheral uh, pacers, organ clocks, um, there are cells within organs, like the liver, like the stomach, that function uh, maximally at certain times of the day, and they have their own rhythms. And so thousands of years ago, the Chinese understood this, and the idea that it's best to eat earlier in the day than later, it's best to fast overnight. This, this new, I, new idea of intermittent fasting uh, really is um, uh, in line with the idea that your body functions best, your organs function best only at certain times of day, the day. So here again, we find that Western and Eastern medicine uh, dovetail again uh, nicely. Um, <clears throat> this is just a, a diagram showing the, uh, the three great circuits. So. Um, the ear is a, a reflex um, microsystem like foot reflexology. Uh, I tend to use a lot of ear acupuncture. Um, if you imagine an uh, upside down baby on your ear um, with the back um, going up the side, and you can do a lot just with ear acupuncture alone, particularly for psycho-emotional problems. One of the reasons that ear acupuncture is so useful is that the, one of the central nerves in the brain called the vagus nerve those all over your body connects with all of your organs and there's a branch of it that comes up onto your ear. So by needling your ear, you basically are plugging right into your brain. And uh, this is particularly useful for um, anxiety, depression, um, uh, post-traumatic stress uh, syndromes, um, as well as musculoskeletal problems. So um, uh, there are these layers of um, acupuncture uh, um, uh, paradigms that can be um, compared to like fractals in nature. You know how there can be in a flower or a tree, there can be smaller and smaller versions of it represented on the other leaves. And in the brain, we're discovering that there are, it's not just one brain map uh, as they supposed, but there are areas that have smaller and smaller uh, maps of the whole body uh, within the brain as a, as a sort of a redundancy. And that explains why, you know, after strokes or, or um, uh, uh, brain damage, you can retrain your brain. The brain is plastic. This is a newer concept. When I w was going to medical school, it was like, well, if you, you had an injury, that was it, you were done. But uh, we now know that, that um, you can, you can uh, retrain your brain and regain a lot of um, capability. And um, this is just another area where it points to the fact that there's redundancy built within the body. Um, for those of you who are really interested in how, like the how of it, how acupuncture works, this, uh, uh, Dr. Daniel Kuhn um, wrote an excellent book called The Spark in the Machine. And that explains how, um, in it, from an embryology point of view, how a certain cells migrate to certain part of the bodies, and there's a direct correlation between these types of cells and the, the, where they end up and the channels in acupuncture. And this is just a, uh, a schematic of all the different types of embryo, that's, a, that's an embryo, um, 
right here, very, very early, and all the different uh, types of cells and how, where, they, where they go to. And, and the neural crest cells, these are the ones that, uh, that migrate and form all kinds of um, different structures and that end up, um, you can correlate them to um, uh, at the acupuncture channels. So it's, it's really an interesting book. I would recommend it. So the game, game going on with the how of acupuncture works, um, there's lots of biochemical things that happen when you insert an acupuncture needle, but, but I think the, the most uh, prominent um, way that acupuncture works is through the fascia. The fascia is that uh, covering of your muscles um, that's, um, you know, when you're cleaning a chicken, that white part just above the, the meat. Um, that uh, is composed of collagen. And uh, collagen is a uh, three-stranded molecule, so if you imagine a braid, and it's, um, it's got the uh, same quality as quartz crystal. So when you mechanically stress collagen um, and then release that stress, which happens when an acupuncturist puts in a needle and they give it just a little twist at the end, and then relax, or they might like peck or do other things with the acupuncture needle. Um, the collagen, which is in the fascia, which is in your skin, it's in all aspects of your, of your uh, body, um, it releases these little, quart uh, these little um, uh, microcurrents. And these microcurrents send messages to the larger nerves. And in combination with the points that you have selected, it's like computer programming, the input will create a predictable output. So somehow the brain knows that when they get messages from these certain points, they need to do certain things. And the combinations are important because this point here that got rid of my headache, this point here can also start labor in a pregnant woman at the appropriate time. You know, so, uh, and we combine it with certain other points. Um, this point here is um, good for uh, neck pain. It's good for all kinds of uh, things. That, and, and some of the stronger points in acupuncture have multiple uses depending upon the other points that you combine with them. And this has been determined by, you know, trial and error over 2,000 years. Um, another um, good book would be The Body Electric that talks about the, the body is an electrical, you are an electrical being. You know, you couldn't do an electrocardiogram if you were not an elect electrical being. You, you know, you couldn't do MRIs if there was not a component of electromagnetism. Um, and Dr. Becker did an interesting study with uh, salamanders and frogs where, you know, a salamander can regrow its limb. Uh, once you cut off a limb of a salamander, uh, you... Um, get a, a, a change in the positive negative charge on the cells at the end. Frogs won't do this unless you change the charge electrically and then you can get a frog to regrow its limb. So when you, when you put in an acupuncture needle, you are um, cha changing the flow of electrons into the body and you are allowing healing to occur. So essentially, acupuncture is a very complex biomedical information therapy because it, you're, you're giving the body information that it needs to determine what it should do to heal itself. So uh, in the last uh, several minutes, we're just gonna talk briefly about what you can use acupuncture for. Um, it, it's uh, not just for back pain, so. Um, so for allergy, for example, I'm uh, just going to give uh, very short case presentations of some of my patients. Um, this nine-year-old boy now is 12. Um, I've been seeing him for, for maintenance for several years. He used to have very frequent nosebleeds because of allergic rhinitis. And uh, he did start coming um, for acupuncture. Um, initially, he came with his mother who was having acupuncture for uh, complications of uh, chemo chemotherapy. And he was fascinated. And he's like, can I try that? And so he actually had a reason to need it. And um, after a while, they, they didn't come as often, but um, then he started on some medications. But the medications were actually making this kid depressed, and which is a known side effect of uh, this the particular medication called Singular. And so that was discontinued, and he came back, started acupuncture again a little more frequently, and then now he's back on, comes once a month for maintenance. 
Um, in women's health, uh, I tend to do a lot of women's health since that's my my specialty, um, although I haven't delivered a baby in like seven years now, but um, I still am very involved with um, uh, for infertility, uh, cycle regulation, uh, labor induction, and postpartum uh, problems. And uh, But when I was working in the hospital I, where I had acupuncture privileges, um, I was able to use acupuncture to um, help this lady who had a history of postpartum urinary retention with her first pregnancy. She uh, had an injury to her urethra, which is the tube that connects the bladder um, to the outside, um, and couldn't, had to self-catheterize for three months. She couldn't pee after she had a baby, yeah. And so she was really nervous about this happening again, and lo and behold, after her delivery, she started not to be able to completely empty her bladder. So her, the midwife who was taking care of her uh, asked me if I might be able to do something about that, and um, I, uh, I treated her once on the, her first postpartum day, and uh, she was able to avoid regularly, but I did have her come back to the hospital um, for like a couple of weeks thereafter just to kind of keep things going, and she never had to self-catheterize, not even once. We talked a little bit about mental health issues. Um, this is a little unusual. Um, this lady had um, a condition, um, uh, trichotillomania, trichotillomania, where you like pull out your hair when you're nervous. And she'd had this going on since she was a little kid. And um, her psychologist sent her. And so uh, with, with only a few visits, she really settled it down very, very nicely. And then... Um, I didn't see her for about two years, and then she called me up and said, we're buying a house, I've started to, you know, so she came in for like one or two treatments until, until escrow closed, and then she was fine again, you know, but it, it really did help to, um, to, to settle all that down, and it was like, you know, you could see, like, she was, like, pulling out chunks of hair, so, so, you know, you wouldn't think, like, how could acupuncture help that, but, but because it balances the, central nervous system and calms the, the brain down. It, it really does do interesting things. Um, I see a number of patients, oncology patients, for um, before, during, and after their treatments for a variety of reasons, uh, commonly complications of chemotherapy or um, complications from surgery, um, also stress reduction. Um, and so uh, this is just one of the, the people that I um, uh, was seeing. And, and her um, uh, chemotherapy can also cause brain fog, uh, where you just can't remember things. You can't work through problems as easily as you used to. And she found that it was very helpful for that, too. And she did notice when she was off island for uh, various uh, therapies that when there was a gap in her acupuncture treatments, she did kind of backslide. But we caught it up again when she came back. So, um, With uh, migraine and musculoskeletal disorders, they're often very uh, related. There's one lady that I've uh, been seeing for a couple of years now, and uh, about, I guess now 25 years ago or so, she was in a terrible car accident when she was pregnant with her um, second child. And um, she, uh, out of the seven cervical discs in the neck, that accident caused five of those discs to bulge, and she had a misalignment of the upper, the second upper um, uh, disc, and she was having more than 20 migraines a month in spite of medications, um, and she had tried Botox, and um, it just, nothing really seemed to work. So she started to come, um, her family doctor sent her for acupuncture. Um, she was coming, um, weekly, and that started to settle things down in terms of frequency and intensity of the migraines. And now um, she's like able to you know, live more. She had gained a lot of weight because she was just like so incapacitated. She was still working, but she you know, was miserable. And she was starting to um, exercise more. And this is a, one main way that I find that acupuncture is helpful for people. It just makes them feel better, and so they are able to take care of themselves better and make better choices. And then that really snowballs in a positive way. So now, uh, I just saw her last week. So now um, she has about one migraine every three weeks um, and occasional sort of tension headaches. Um, and we're still, we're still working on it. I think we can do 
do better, but it, you know, it's a very long, long history. And that's one thing with, uh, with acupuncture, if you do go for a chronic problem, it will take longer for it to resolve or improve than if it was just that you, you know, tweaked your back. Um, this um, uh, ACUS Foundation is a, um, a, a charitable foundation that trains military doctors. Um, it's, it's in the VA system. Um, they did a pilot project in um, uh, Nellis Air Force Base where they trained all the family doctors to do uh, ear acupuncture and some basic uh, acupuncture um, at, at any appointment at, on request, any time. So you, you could go in and see your doctor. You didn't have to make a special appointment and come back. And they did a one-year pilot project, and this is what they discovered. Um, they decreased their opioid prescription rate by 45% and their muscle relaxant prescription rate by 35%, and they saved a quarter of a million dollars on pain management uh, referrals to outside consultants. And so that's just like the first year. So um, uh, we have a few minutes just to talk about, um, you know, is acupuncture really a true thing or is it just all in, all in your head, you know? <laughs> Essentially, it is all in your head because everything happens, in, you know, in your brain. Um, uh, this is uh, MRI studies of um, ac real acupuncture and pretend acupuncture, and they've created these devices where um, it really looks like, and almost feels like, you're having an acupuncture needle put in. They, they kind of hide, acupuncture needles sometimes ca come in um, guide tubes, and they kind of hide it so that it looks like the, the practitioner's tapping in the, the, um, the needle and you kind of feel like they might be there. And uh, acupuncturists who've had the, the sham acupuncture, they say, you know, kind of feels like it, like it really could be it. So um, uh, there is definitely something going on in the brain with the, the sham acupuncture, but as you can see from the top, top ones, there's more going on in terms of, of blood flow and activity with the real acupuncture. And with studies that show that sham acupuncture is almost as good as real acupuncture, um, the reason that I think that that occurs is that when you even just press on your skin, you are activating the collagen. Um, you're creating mechanical stress in that area. You're sending electrical signals. This is why massage will work. This is why acupressure will work. So um, these days, um, the funding, uh, for acupuncture studies, they're not even looking at um, uh, studies that have a sham arm. There's, they're just like, forget that. You know, they're looking at whole person systems. Uh, you can never really separate why a therapy works or even a pill works from the person who's giving you the pill, the institution in which, you know, the University of, of Hawaii Cancer Center, you know, some very prestigious, reputable place, you know, that, uh, sets up your expectations, and that translates into very real, legitimate biological reactions. And so, um, so uh, there is really no such thing as sham. So, so, so um, this is basically the discussion of the of your homework, um, because a lot of people do do you know they come back for their second treatment and they go. Well, I feel a whole lot better. I, I, I don't know if it's my imagination or if it's all in my head, but I, you know, and so that's when we have this discussion about what occurs in the healing response. Um, for those of you who are interested in exploring that further, there's an excellent book uh, that came out recently called How Healing Works by Dr. Wayne Jonas. And he explores uh, not just in Chinese medicine, but in all other medicines, how, how there is, um, uh, the innate healing ability within the body um, that translates from your experience into, into biochemistry. Um, my professor in medical school, Dr. Robert Murray, he would say, he was my biochemistry professor, he would say, biochemistry is everything. And I thought he was just, you know, it was his subject area. But the more I learn about medicine in general and acupuncture and Chinese medicine in particular, the more I realize that he was correct. So. So um, in closing, I would just uh, say that um, 
Uh, although I have chosen to focus on Chinese medicine and particularly acupuncture as my modality to help people heal, uh, there are natural forces within us that are the best healers of disease. <laughs>